Okay, so it's uh, two and Eastern uh, time. So uh, thanks, Bill, for joining us for a presentation on a gonna go over to exploring and replacing eJabber D. So to write that time, <laughs> XMPP for open surf. I wanted to thank our sponsors, uh, Mobius, Equinox, and Emerald Data, our champion sponsors. Uh, Equinox being the sponsor for Hopin and Emerald Data being the sponsor for captioning. So uh, I will throw in the link for captioning in a moment. Um, otherwise, I believe that's it, except that the recording will be available after the conference is over, as well as the slides will be on our website. All right, Bill, so I think that's it for me, and you can take it away when you want. Thanks, Gina. Um, I saw your presentation, and it occurred to me that my slides are the opposite of uh, meme-friendly. They're just sort of uh, not super fun. <laughs> this uh, this theme is called Void, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to throw in a Simpsons reference for you, but uh, I'll do that next time. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so what I'm talking about here is uh, uh, just I, I, I'll just try random experiments sometimes to see how things work, um, just to try new new software, um, things like that. And I wasn't really expecting this to go anywhere or to be anything all that interesting. But the more I played with it, the more I sort of started liking what I was seeing. Um, and I was able to get something working, which was neat. And um, so I thought I would present it here for do one of the short sessions on it. And then, of course, as soon as I put in the um, the session topic, uh, then I want to, you know, polish it and get all the rough edges cleaned up and everything and, and work on a lot more. So then I have more to talk about. So um, the uh, the slides I'm looking at today are available on my GitHub. Uh, they have in both the markdown and the HTML is there. Um, and I can put that in the chat just in case. Oh, um, so what is this experiment that I'm talking about? Um, eJabberD or eJabberd. Uh, I don't know if there's really a, a right way to pronounce that. It's kind of a mouthful either way. Um, is the messaging layer in Evergreen? So it's the it's the thing at the very bottom that sends a message from the search service to the c-store service or this service to that service it's how all the data gets back and forth between the different services that enter enter communicate um it's there's nothing wrong with each um and any one of these things i have listed here as possible complications are things that could happen to any software each has a special quality though of sort of accumulating problems um, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's it's annoying. And that's why I said here that it's it's haunted. We've been using it forever, and it works great. It's very stable. It's very solid. Um, it uh, you know I, I like I said I didn't really set out to to try to over you know overtake all of this, but um, this is this is where we are. And so it, it, you know some of these things kind of bubble up as I start thinking about it. It's kind of annoying. It's often installation issues um i run i do all my dev on linux containers and the way it's installed by default you have to install it and it won't install and you have to change the preferences files and then kind of reinforce it to install and it it just it keeps coming up with all these complications so you know it tends to be something that we um grumble about in irc sometimes so that's part of why i might want to replace it. but also maybe there's just better stuff uh, and I'm just talking about one potential thing today. Um, so I'm a big fan of the Stack Overflow Developer Survey. They do it yearly. And I really like it because they ask a variety of questions and they ask them from different directions. Uh, and one of the ones that they, uh, one of the questions I always like is, you know, what software do you like using? Not just what are you using, but, what, you know, if you're using this in a professional setting, do you like it? And um, so there's a lot of great dat data on there. And I always find fun stuff in there to play with. Um, and parenthetically, I'm, I'm learning Rust, uh, the programming language. So if anyone er is also doing that, we can talk shop about that at some point. Um, but the uh, so there's a application called Redis that is consistently at the top of the uh, database uh, applications that uh, developers and admins and users really like. It keeps coming up and I've looked at it before and I, I get the appeal. It's very clean. It's very simple. 
<clears throat> and um, so I sort of set off to just kind of do an experiment. Like, could I, could you use this as a replacement for the messaging system in, in OpenSurf? Um, and a couple of more reasons here why I just really like the application in general. Um, and I'm going to hit on a few of these specifically as I go through. So the way I designed my experiment was um, Redis has something that it calls, it has various data stores that it can uh, do in, in, in this sort of um, in-memory data set. So you can do, you know, hash type things, object type things, lists, just simple key value pairs, and lots of other stuff. So the way I set up my experiment was to... Um, had to use lists. And the reason I did that is because there are a number of interesting ways to enter, to access lists in Redis. And the thing that caught my attention uh, at first was that there are blocking operations. So um, if you put something into a list, so let's say a client puts some data into a list in the Redis data store. Um, and just for, if it helps for anyone to think about this, it's kind of like memcache. Um, so you can have just sort of key value pairs and put them there. Uh, memcache on steroids, I guess you could say. Uh, so if that, if that helps you visualize it a little bit. But uh, so you can have a list in there. If some client puts something in a list. There could be another client that's connected to that. And it's basically waiting for something to show up in that list. And then as soon as something shows up, it pops the value out and hands it to that other client. So the way I set up my um, messaging experiment here was the, um, a client would push uh, technically R push, so push to the right side of the list, sort of like a Q. Um, R push a JSON open surf request into this well-known list name, which I have set up here, service colon open ILS act, open ILS that actor. Um, and then the actor service would do a blocking list pop, pull that request off. It would get the from address from the client who did that, and it would send the responses directly to that client. Um, and then if a client needs to do a connected session to a service, then um, the communication can continue that way and they will both talk directly to each other, kind of like how it works now. You're using a direct communication at that point. Um, so the, that's, that's the, the message handling in a nutshell, list popping, list pushing, list popping to essentially create a queue where requests flow in and then flow back into the service. So the way I ended up doing this, um, again, I didn't set out to do this. It just kind of worked this way. Um, the main differences to what I have implemented and the way uh, OpenSurf works now is um, the uh, the code that I implemented just doesn't even use the OpenSurf router. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more of this in a second. Um, the, the router itself is just gone. Um, the messages on the what I call the, the data bus are just JSON. So right now with eJabberD, you it, it gets packaged up in XML because of the XMPP protocols, goes over XML. So that XML outer layer is gone. So the, the data is a little bit smaller and doesn't have quite as much um, packing and unpacking to go through. And then I also propose some changes to the OpenSurf core file to accommodate some of these differences. So the first one there is obviously kind of a big deal, um, not having the routers. So what does the router do? And, and by all means, if I miss something here, please, uh, you know, please let me know because um, some of this stuff has just been working the way it's been working for so long that we don't even really think about it all that much. So the main things that came to mind to me when it comes to what the router does, it, um, it routes requests to listener services. So you could have multiple actor listeners on a single router. Requests go to actor, for example. The router is going to round robin between the listeners. Um, it provides uh, segregation or different destinations for public and private services. This is really critical because private services um, essentially give you keys to the kingdom. If you can talk to C-Store, then you can manipulate the database to a very large degree. Um, so that's something that obviously has to remain protected. And um, the router also has a, uh, it knows what's actively running at a given time. 
Uh, I see a comment here from Mike. Uh, additional router pros make service restarts transparent, makes high availability possible. Um, motion captions had timestamps. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I might need you to ex uh, uh, expand on the on the that in a second, Mike. Um, one thing. Uh, so just to kind of uh, list how these are handled in the implementation here, the um, routes request to one or more listeners. The way this operation here works, you can have uh, as many clients as you want doing a blocking left pop on a list or blocking pop. Um, and then the Redis will hand the messages off just to the next one in line. So it's essentially round robin the same way the router would in that case. Um, the separate destinations for public and private services, uh, I implement differently. And I'll explain that more in a second. And then the the item of knows what services are actively running for a domain. Um, I, I talk about this again in a minute. Uh, and this may not be as high priority as some of the other uh, issues. Um, let's see. And <laughs> by the way, I'm not suggesting we change the name. I just that was the natural outcome of the work I was doing. So I have an install doc on uh, GitHub. Um, <clears throat> right now, the branches I'm talking about are on GitHub. Uh, they can you know, obviously be moved wherever. Uh, that's just where I tend to do things by default now. So uh, the installation, um, if you're on Ubuntu before 22, you have to add the, uh, the repository because we want certain features in Redis 6 and above. You change your config file to tell it not to save data to disk. You can do that. I mean, you can, you can have it save to disk. But since I'm using it as a message bus, I just disable that since it's um, doing unnecessary disk writes. Uh, then restart Redis. Get the uh, sample OpenSurf config file in place. Install the working branch for OpenSurf and Evergreen. And then there's a command here that manages um, uh, manages the accounts that are allowed to access the message bus and control how they access that. And that's a command that has to be run there. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to circle back and make sure that we I don't miss anything in the comments, um, but I'll go ahead and work through kind of my my script here um, and then we can uh, make sure that I, you know, I'm not making some crazy assumptions with what I'm doing. So one thing I wanted to show was, uh, for a couple of reasons, um, the with the router not being part of the communication process, with the um, less data packing and unpacking, and with the simple fact I can only assume that Redis is just quite fast naturally, the um, um, performance of this kind of surprised me. Uh, so I set up some. Um, some scripts to just try different message types, things like that. So I'm going to show that first, and then I'll demo some other stuff. So I'm using the um, SSH client baked in, or the SSH extension in Chrome. I figured out I was able to demo all in one window if I do that. So, um, so this is uh, Evergreen Master. Well, it's not. It's Evergreen. It's it's a working branch for some Angular stuff, but it's essentially current Evergreen. Um, and then I have this machine and another machine. They're both running on the same host and they have using the same log level, same everything else. So this is my um, current Jabber system. And I do kind of break down uh, three different message sizes. And then I run each uh, with different um, one, one where we're not connecting to the router or connecting to the session and one where we are doing a connected session, which essentially takes the router out of the equation for the once the first message has been sent. Um, and I'll just run it again because you know these things have to warm up sometimes. Um, so this just kind of gives you a breakdown of timing of this. And um, so you know those are those are pretty close. Quickest one we have here will be the smallest message where the router is essentially taken out of the equation after the first message, 0.2 um, seconds for 50 messages. So that's pretty fast there. And then the longest will be where we're sending these 14K messages 
and that's five seconds to send 50 messages. Uh, same script over here on my Redis instance um, is goes like that. So it's, you know, obviously visually a stark difference there. Um, best case scenario, not terribly different. What was that? Point one two nine, point two one one. So not quite twice as fast in the best case scenario. But then worst case scenario, um, 50 messages of 14K, 0.2 seconds compared to five seconds. I, I know the, the data there may not really be readable. So if there's something that, uh, you know, I, I you want me to clarify or express, then let me know. It's, um, let me, actually, I can zoom that a little bit more, huh? Okay. There we go. Does that do both of them? It does. All right. Um, and then I'll just do another experiment where we do some parallel stuff. Edit both of these files the same way. Oops. And while I'm doing that, I'll run top in another tab here so you can kind of see how it's working. So 503 parallel, that going. This is the, the Redis version. Oops, I forgot to show top. So um, where, where are you? All right, let me, uh, whoops. It's a little bit easier to see. There's my Redis server. I'll do that again. Oh, it's getting about 22% CPU, practically zero memory. And my script is taking about 10 seconds to run 1,500 messages through of all the different sizes. Same thing over here. Let me get top going. That going, and so just as far as resources go, eJeopardy's you know it's a little bit beefier. It's using uh, ranging between what mid nineties to mid seventies, and then a little bit more memory. But the memory isn't really a concern, I don't think. Um, and then the big thing here is um, on the Redis side. This took about ten seconds, um, and I can already tell you that this is going to take a good bit longer to get these 1500 messages through. Um, I'll let that run for a second. Um, so the other thing I wanted to look at was, does this have any real world? You know, is this purely theoretical? Is this just something a, a Perl script is going to uh, make obvious? Uh, or is it actually gonna affect the way you use the software? And I wanna let it finish just so it's not, um, you know, using resources while I'm doing the other part of the demo. <clears throat> Although that's not super fun to look at. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll pull up the catalogs. All right, getting a little faster, getting through the router. All right, you got this. <laughs> Sorry, I wouldn't. I, I wasn't expecting us to take up quite so much there, uh, but I don't want to control C it because I want to see what the actual final tally is. So it was ten over there. Um, I'll look back at the questions here. Um, a question about why I didn't use the pub sub, the publish and subscribe. Um, the, that would have taken longer to get the initial 
experiment running because of the way um, OpenSurf basically the way it currently sits on a socket and blocks for messages, it, it was just way easier to do it this way. I, it was almost a drop-in replacement at the messaging level. Not entirely, but the PubSub would have been more complicated. Um, and also the PubSub, of course, broadcasts to whoever's listening. And we don't want requests going to multiple people at once. We want them to we just go to one place. Um, OK. Um, so this was two minutes, 21 seconds to do the 1500 messages. And this was 10 seconds. So, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just crazy. So I have catalogs running on these same machines where I just did the demo. Um, I'm just going to page through some search results so you can kind of see what it looks like. This is five results per page. So this is on the eJeopardy jeopardy side. You know, your standard concerto out of the box evergreen setup. And then on here, this is on the Redis side. So there is a noticeable difference in the speed at which the display, the page displays. So I, I feel like there could be pretty significant impact there, um, you know, for all kinds of stuff, just checking out faster and everything else that might be a little bit slow sometimes. Um, okay. And then one of the things that I, I found by accident was if you go to server admin, mark search facet fields, the way this interface is rendered using the automated pcrud stuff, it um, it in, it ends up fleshing this giant XSL file on every row that it grabs the data. So you can see it kind of starts here and then it renders kind of slowly and then it sort of speeds up at the end again. I'll just do that again. It's on the each upper D side. And um, I like this because it, it further clarifies just how much big data goes through really quickly on the Redis side. So I'll do that again. This is the Redis side. So, you know, another visible and obvious difference in speed there. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Uh, there's loads of debugging tools in here. Um, one of the one, well, I can just show you. So let's see here, Redis monitor. Um, I can do that here in the, the catalog, doing that. Then you can see it's, it's showing me all the JSON data that's passing through the system there and the list pop and things, all those fun commands that are running. That's a pretty neat debugging tool. You can get, um, memory stats in different formats. You can do things like, um, isolate different clients and pause them, kill them, get different stats for, uh, the clients. You can see who's connected see, you know, what are the, do we have any data in here that's just way too big? So I can see this, this client has one item um, and it's right now it's the only thing in there. So of course it's the biggest thing in there. Uh, and that's worth mentioning is the way the lists work. As soon as you pop the last thing out of the list, the lists essentially disappear. They don't stick around. And then you can pull up info about keys, kind of like you can do in Memcache. Um, okay. So another thing that I, um, struck me as I was working on this is one thing that would be really, really cool, um, is what I call direct to drone request delivery, which is right now a request comes in, a listener process grabs the request. And this is true for the current code and the code I'm demoing. And then it passes the request down through a pipe to a worker process that then uh, works on the request. Um, and we've had issues over the years uh, where these listener processes would get backed up or something too big would go through or something would happen and they would die. Um, so what I'm proposing as a possible future enhancement is the, the workers themselves pluck the requests off the queues and that way the data doesn't even have to go through the listener. The listener would only be responsible at that point for spawning workers and managing worker processes. Uh, and so there's one less 
serialization uh, process would have to happen. The listener itself wouldn't be doing as much as certain would be doing. There certainly wouldn't be a single failure point for um, everything having to get passed through it. It would just be forking and, and cleaning up children. Uh, so I think that's a potentially really cool thing that we could do down the road with this. Uh, we could use it. Uh, we could use Redis as a, as a replacement for Memcached. It has the ability to persist itself, as I mentioned earlier. So if we had auth keys in there, for example, we could uh, use it inside of Memcached and tell it to persist itself. And then um, if there was an outage, uh, then Redis could start back up and the keys that you thought you had lost would still be on disk. And, um, you know, because right now if Memcached goes down, everyone has to log back in. There's no way to fix that. It's just broken. So that could be a way to uh, help improve that situation. Um, these last two, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we necessarily have to change anything. It just occurred to me that um, the backlog wouldn't be needed anymore simply because Redis itself would act as the backlog. And uh, the chunking and bundling seems a little bit less required because it seems to handle big messages really well um, and really quickly. Um, so what it can't do, um, cross-domain routing. So this is another big obvious thing that the router does. Um, the Dojo UI specifically use this thing called the HTTP translator. And the translator was given the ability uh, a long time ago to, if a message comes into one domain and you tell it it's trying to talk to some other domain, then it could route across domains to a different brick, as we usually call it. Um, we don't use this anymore on the WebSocket side. Uh, we don't use it on the traditional JSON gateway side. It's just on these Dojo UIs. So that's some admin interfaces. There's still a few ACK interfaces, the self-check interface, and a few others that would have to be, um, you know, angularized brought or at least brought over to these web sockets before we could even consider this, honestly. Um, so there's there is no support natively to Redis for setting a max message size. Uh, WebSock the WebSocket gateway already does this, but we could we could add limitations elsewhere. Um, there's also no support for auto auto expiring data, uh, but there are a variety of options for how you manage memory um, and, and how you expire keys once you reach a certain max memory level. And one obvious one, you know, deleting the least recently used would be a way to get, get rid of stuff that may have accumulated that you didn't want to stick around. And it's also trivial to script stuff to find those. Um, wow, I'm running out of time. So uh, securing private services, the way I implemented this was um, using a function ACLs, access control list in Redis, where you can define accounts and you can specify what those accounts can do. So um, I set up, uh, there's a public and a private open serve account and the uh, private one can talk to all the services, the public one can talk to the public services. Um, and then I added a second layer of filtering to the gateway and WebSockets just to prevent anything from coming in that isn't going to a viable public service. So yeah, I'm kind of having to rush through this now. Um, so one of the things I mentioned before is the router, the router knows what's running. And the only thing I've had to change to accommodate this is that right now the circ code tries to see if the booking code is running by asking the router. Um, and so that doesn't work with this because there's no router, but to me, that's something that could be trivially implemented in 10 different ways. So it's just a configuration variable somewhere. Uh, but I could be missing something as to the point of what, what's going on there. Um, yeah, OK. So that's those are my slides. Um, uh, so I'm going to come back and look at the conversation here. And we can carry this on tomorrow in the, uh, in the Hackfest. I'll be there all day for anybody that wants to talk about that. Uh, I don't know what's coming up next, but I'm pretty sure I'm about to get kicked off here. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to happy to keep talking or answering questions in whatever format comes along. Yeah, there is um, that, like Jason said, uh, there is a development session that's open uh, if people want to pop over there because we have a half hour break. Uh, so if you want to do that, you can. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, we do have the expo that's open, so please visit the exhibitors today before the end of the conference at, let's see here, 3 o'clock on track one, we have um, a presentation on curbside pickup service, and in track two is going to be a cataloging interest group. Uh, then at 4 
at the keynote and closing, we're going to have our closing statement along with the devs update and uh, something from the project board too.